All right, everybody, we are going to kick this thing off in just a moment. Uh, if you could hit that like, hit that share, get the word out about this video that we're going to be premiering in just a minute. We're going to be talking about rent strikes. We're going to be talking about the Blair Battle of Blair Mountain. Um, I'm excited to talk to you guys about this. So make sure you hit that like, make sure you hit that share. We're going to be kicking off in just a moment. Okay. All right. How we doing out there? Hello. Hello and welcome to today's Road Reflection. I'm your host, Chris Mohan. Thank you for hanging out. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we got a we got a fun, exciting show for you guys today. Uh, I'm going to try to do something possibly a little bit more interesting. We'll, we'll find out uh, if I have time to do the interesting, fun, new toy thing that I have. Um, but uh, I, I, let's do our check-in. Um, had a rough start to today. Kind of had a, I think, a caffeine-like headache situation when I woke up, and I didn't really understand what it was. My eyes hurt. My head hurt. My uh, neck was in pain, and I, I feel like it was because I didn't have caffeine uh, in the evening. Because um, that is the, uh, that's the drug that I'm addicted to. Uh, so I've got my I've got my extra dosage of caffeine today uh, that I'll be sipping on throughout the um, throughout the episode. Other than that, um, uh, you know, today has been relatively okay so far. Um, trying to focus on the tasks at hand, um, trying to keep myself, um, <clears throat> you know. Uh, motivated, trying to keep myself productive. That's the that's always the goal, um, you know. And and I would always like to wake up a little bit earlier. That seems to be the that seems to be the trend that's happening uh, during during quarantine. Is uh, I am uh, you know just not waking up as early as I normally would, as I normally would like to. Uh, but in some positive news, today is April fifteenth. It is. Uh, my 17th comedy anniversary huzzah yay um i'm not much for like celebration i just mention it to mention it to keep track of it mostly uh but yeah 17 years um in, in doing stand up i started in high school i kept doing it through college i've been touring for i guess now 10 years ish well the last month has not been touring uh but <laughs> Uh, 10 years, 10 years of, of, of touring. Um, hopefully we'll get back to that. Uh, but I will, I am, I, I, I only mention it for a couple of reasons because I, uh, if you're not signed up to my email list, you should sign up to my email list because you get fun little surprises like this, which is, um, I sent, uh, an email to my email list doing a little compare and contrast. Uh, I found the earliest recording of myself um, that I have released on the interwebs and I released a, a brand new stand-up comedy clip as well. So if you are subscribed to my YouTube channel, if you are following me on the, uh, social medias and, uh, on the Facebooks and all that, all that jazz, then you probably saw that I put out a brand new stand-up comedy clip. It's, it's a, um, short early version or, well, early in, re in relativity, um, uh, of one of the, uh, newest bits that will be released on my upcoming album, Politely Angry. So I released that, uh, you know, to, uh, in, in sort of a, hey, this is a thing, uh, this is a, uh, some kind of a momentous, monumentous thing that we should all, uh, be aware of as, as part of my life, I guess, or whatever it is. Um, I'm not big on the celebration aspect of it. I, I probably um, should be. I kind of just do it as a way to keep track of things, I guess, the, the passage of time or whatever. Like, I'm not even big on celebrating my own birthday. Like, my what I really like to do on my birthday is either do a show, which uh, hopefully this year that'll happen, um, 
or I just kind of, uh, I just like hanging out, you know, just like, let's get, let's go out for dinner with a few people and get a couple drinks and, or let's just have some people over, uh, you know, order a fucking pizza and bullshit over some pizza and beer and, uh, yeah, that's kind of the, that's kind of my thing. I, I, I like that. I have enough, uh, craziness that happens throughout my life that I feel like these, um, these moments of celebration are more or less moments that I would like to take the opportunity to be at peace <laughs> and not do something over the top and exciting. Um, so I wanted to bring that up. Um, exciting little thing, 17 years. So if you, if you are on my email list, you definitely got an email doing a little, Hey, check out this new thing, um, at, at, at year 17 and check out this thing I found from year one. Um, and I watched it and it's real difficult for me to watch. Like the material, I, I'm just like, I wrote this. I thought this was funny. I thought this was things I should say out loud into a microphone. This is crazy. This is crazy. Um, my sister recorded the video uh, it's actually recorded at a coffee shop that no longer exists, which is uh, pretty close to the apartment complex that I'm in, um, with, with that I'm living in with my parents right now. And, uh, you know, um, it, it sucks that it's not there. I, when I take my walks, I, I you know, I, I sometimes pass through the construction zone um, that this coffee shop uh, used to be at. It was called the Coffee Den. Um I recorded um, an album that only a few people have ever uh, listened to, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and keep it that way, that only a few people will have ever listened to it. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe one day you'll, you, it'll, it'll be released. I, it, here, I'll, I might release it as part of uh, the Bandcamp subscription. Um, a, the one of the features of Bandcamp is that you can become a sustaining member. You can become like a subscriber or a VIP member or whatever. Um, and uh, what I'm planning on doing is releasing a bunch of, uh, I, and I have, I've released a bunch of unreleased material, storytelling shows, things that like seldom anybody's ever heard um, or, you know, in transition shows or new material nights. Uh, fringe festival performances, things, things of that sort. Um, and I probably will do a few more of those in the coming months. Um, yeah, I think that might be the plan there, but maybe I'll, maybe I'll release that today. Uh, cause I have them, I have them somewhere. I have, uh, uh, the album, which I, I called reach for the mic. Cause I was a d uh, dopey fucking 17 year old kid, uh, that decided that's what I wanted to name the album. <laughs> <laughs> oh man so it might be available on the band camps um for for sustaining members uh so that'll be that'll be fun that'll be an option that that people can <laughs> dig into from 2006 maybe uh but yeah it's uh that's that's happening today um but uh, that is not the the meat. Uh, I'll here. Here's the thing. I'll I'll tell you guys uh, the story of how I got started uh, on Saturday for for storytelling Saturday. I'll do I'll do I'll I'll run through the uh, first show that I ever did and kind of how the material formed and things of that sort. How a young impressionable sixteen year old child. Um, yeah, 2005 uh, came came to this. So is it 15 or I don't know. Uh, but that was that's today. That's today. Um, anyway, let's get into uh, our 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 entire stories for the day. Um, this has been floating around for a while, and I've been thinking about it, and I've been going back and forth about it for a bit. And I've been talking a lot about uh, um, strikes and the labor movement and things of that sort. But I, didn't, I, I, I wanted to talk about rent strikes, but I wanted to do, you know, I wanted to know what the fuck I'm actually talking about when I, when I talk about these sort of things. Um, instead of just willy-nilly 
just coming out and being like, we got to we got to strike on rants and stuff like that. So um, and I know that's been going around, um, especially since April 1st was coming up and a lot of people uh, that didn't have a steady source of income or have lost their steady source of income or a majority of uh, their income, you know, uh, full time performers being one of them, bartenders, uh, anybody in the service industry, people that owned a restaurant, um, things of that sort, all kind of lost um, a majority of, if not all, of their income. Um, so that comes to how are we going to pay bills? What are we going to do about rent? Um, I will say, you know, in, in terms of full disclosure, I, I am not in a rent situation because I am uh, staying with my parents right now, um, going through a life transition. Uh, some of you might know what that life transition actually is, uh, but, it, you know, it's not it's not a super public thing. But but the staying with my parents thing is is, is a public thing and that comes with its own challenges. Um, so I am lucky enough that at this moment, I don't have to worry about rent. Uh, but I did have other bills that I did have to worry about um, that some of them I was able to get a, uh, a moratorium on. And we, and we can talk about the differences in that, too, um, in, in what the terms, what like moratoriums are and things of that sort. Um, basically... Well, let's let's start with that. Uh, basically, from from what I've read, the moratoriums are just where you don't gain interest, right? They're just like, okay, uh, if it's like a rent moratorium, they're like, okay, you don't have to pay rent um, this month, but you know you will have to pay the rent. Like if they if they say there's a rent moratorium for April and May, and you don't have to pay anything till June, well, um, in June you will have to back pay that rent. Um, you know, eviction moratoriums essentially mean that same thing. So, you know, if you can't pay in April or May or whatever, um, you will eventually have to pay that back. Um, so there is back pay involved in these moratoriums. Same thing with the mortgage moratoriums. Um, you know, and I don't think this is the, this is the right way to kind of move forward. What, what I think a lot of people are asking for and a lot of people think is the right thing to do is a total freeze on rent, mortgages, debts, things of that sort. Um, so let's let's talk about what this rent strike is, because there are places that aren't doing any of this. They're not doing moratoriums. They're not even thinking about freezes. Um, right. So a rent strike is um, employed against large landlords when a group of tenants refuse to pay their rent in mass so it's got to be all of the all of the people all of the tenants uh living under you know under a a uh, housing institution uh an apartment a townhouse uh you know even if it's a group living situation if everybody in that group living situation uh, you know, if your landlord owns multiple houses and things of that sort, if everybody, um, you know, under this landlord decides, hey, we're not going to we're not going to pay rent. We don't think it's fair. We don't have an income. This situation is, you know, um, not something that we asked for. It's not something that we created. So it has to be everybody involved. Now, there are some risks in doing this. Um, the risks are eviction. And reduction in credit scores. That second one, uh, probably to a lot of people in my generation, in the millennial generation, could give a shit less. Um, and I'm not, I'm not just kind of saying that, big, but, but realistically, like, who gives a shit about our credit scores when we can't feed our families or pay our, um, pay our bills, uh, you know, take care of the important things that we need to take care of right now um you know so who gives a shit about your credit score the eviction thing is probably something that is uh of more concern to um people is because this is the middle of a pandemic and if people are going to be evicted uh that seems kind of crazy and there are states that are uh preventing to do that 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 don't you know that they're basically like you can't evict people right now um, evictions are out of the question. So don't even, don't even like, and not only that, but the courts aren't operating and most municipal courts do see landlord tenant debates. 
So, you know, the courts aren't operating. So if somebody doesn't pay their rent in April because they legitimately can't because they've lost the majority of their income or all of their income, um, and it's between, you know, paying rent and eating food, you know, what court is going to be like, oh, yeah, you got to back pay that off or you got to, well, an unjust court would do something like that, which, you know, there's plenty of those. Um, so I know a lot of people would sit there and be like, well, Chris, this is crazy. Like, what an insane idea. This will never work. First of all, people say that about strikes all the time. People say that strikes don't work all the time. That that they're that they're over the top. They're insane. Um, they're they're hostage situations. Whatever the fuck, whatever fuck propaganda you have against labor organization and and strikes, um, you know you're just wrong because strikes have been proven to work in the labor movement. Uh, they have been a, a, a source of, you know, achieving um, basic human rights when basic human rights have been uh, infringed upon, especially in the workplace or possibly in a tenant situation. Um, and rent strikes have actually worked. There have been several rent strikes that have taken place in Europe, Africa and North America, dating all the way back to the 1880s. Uh, most of them, most of them run by women, actually. Uh, so that I thought was kind of cool. Um, you know, one of them in the UK, uh, ran for like 14 months. It was 14 months of rent strikes that was organized by these women that were basically, um, you know, and this is, this is late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, or no, I'm sorry. This is not late. This is, this is the seventies is when this was, uh, you know, and, and basically, um, their their rents were going up by a pound a day and uh and they were like no we're not gonna that's kind of crazy we can't do you can't do that to us uh and they they held a rent strike and because everybody was involved because the entire building was involved and all of the tenants supported each other um and all of the tenants had each other's backs it was a lot harder for the landlord to evict everybody from the building because you know that is a that is a risk on the landlord's part because you know if let's say that he does that and let's say it's 100 tenants that he evicts out of his apartments now he has to fill in another 100 tenants to fill up that apartment to make sure that he has money for the next month which you know he's he hasn't received that money in the first place or he or she they um you know so at that point, it becomes a risk for the for the landlord themselves uh, when all of the tenants are standing in solidarity. And, you know, it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to um, evict and get rid of one or two people uh, rather than, you know, an entire building. So if the entire building, if the entire tenants um, are, are going to stand uh, together, then this thing works. And that's, that's realistically the only way a rent strike is going to work. So if you're trying to think of whether you want to implement a rent strike um, in your building for the months going forward, which a lot of people are doing right now, a lot of people have basically said, we can't pay April. I mean, what are we going to do? We don't have a job. Uh, we don't have income. And there's no way to make an income because there's no jobs to make an income because of the because of the coronavirus. So, you know, some people can work from home, some people can't. So everybody needs to, you know, be aware of what's going on. And, um, you know, that's one thing that I feel like by by being in the current situation that I'm in, that I that I don't feel like I have that I don't feel like I have this solidarity with the building that I live in. I don't know who my neighbors are. I was never really encouraged. Like I lived here, boy, the last time I really lived here was in my early 20s. So, so you know, it was like 22, 23, and I didn't really get to know my neighbors. Um, there were a couple of old ladies that I got to know a little bit. Um, that's a good thing that happens. Uh, older women, uh, like I'm talking about like golden girls uh, age, um, you know, like there, there are some Blanches. There's some Blanches that live in this building for sure. 
Uh, I've met him. I've talked to him. They hit on me awkwardly. And then I don't know what to do. And I just uh, uh, giggle and uh, run into the elevator. That's really all I could do. Um, but, you know, I, there was really no encouragement of, of um, getting to know the neighbors, getting to know who's on your floor or, or any of that sort of stuff. Everybody kind of keeps to themselves. And, you know, in almost every single neighborhood that I've lived in, that seems to be the mentality here. Um, that, that, that's not really the mentality that I grew up with either. Like when I was in India, that was not the mentality. I knew fucking everybody that lived in my building in India and they all knew me. So like it was much harder for me to get away with shit because <laughs> they all knew my mom. They all knew my mom, you know, uh, but like here it's just like neighbors aren't really encouraged to talk to each other. Everybody kind of is supposed to keep within their fucking white picket fence. And um, and and that that in and of itself, um, you know, discourages that community. It discourages solidarity. It takes away from the strength that you really have. And I'm not saying you're going to be best friends with you know with with your next door neighbor you might not be you might be i don't i don't know maybe you know but um but that's part of it you should know who's here so if you go to your neighbors and they go oh chris look uh, you're you're home you're usually not home for this long and they go oh yeah i lost you know um basically two and a half months worth of work um and they go, oh my God, that's ridiculous. You, why don't you come over and have some dinner with us? You know, we'll, we'll, let's talk about it. Let's, maybe we'll come up with an idea. Um, you know, I, I heard, uh, you know, Mrs. Giannis down the, down the, she needs some help. Maybe she can, you know, she can, you can earn a little scratch maybe doing, doing some groceries or something for her or something, you know, and then the community starts to build um, from there, so when it comes down to it, and, and they go, how? What are you going to do about rent? What are you going to do? And I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. And they go, well, we got to. I wonder how many other people in the building are facing the same. And then it builds and builds, and now you have a bunch of people that are like, yeah, you know what? We're all kind of caught in the same bullshit. Or if we're not caught in the same bullshit, we know enough people that are that we should stick together with them. Um, <clears throat> the second aspect of this, once the the tenants come into solidarity. And they and they say, you know, this is not a system we created, but we are victims of it. Um, and we will we we don't think that it's fair that we have to, uh, you know, pay rents and things of that sort. The, the Cheesecake Factory couldn't afford its rent. And the landlords of the Cheesecake Factory was like, yeah, don't worry about it. Hey, we got you covered for the next couple months, you know, but but they're not doing that for us. They're not doing that for small businesses. Right. These bigger um bigger sort of real estate companies uh, are, are just, they're just not giving a shit um, about us. The second aspect of this, though, is getting the landlords themselves to be on the tenant side. Um, because as much as we're looking for rent freezes and rent forgiveness, um, I think the landlord's should probably look for mortgage freezes and mortgage forgiveness that their mortgages aren't extended and they don't have to do this back pay bullshit. Um, so if the landlords can be on the tenant side, when there's a rent strike going on in solidarity, the landlords could run a mortgage strike as well. So, uh, that, that is something that I think, um, is probably a necessity that, um, would really make a, a pretty large impact, uh, f uh, you know, to, to kind of show the federal government about where we stand as people and where we stand um, when we stand together. I lost my pen. Ah, back. Um, but, you know, really what we have in the United States uh, is a pause. That's what we have. We hit the pause button on rent. Um, we didn't really get, we didn't really freeze it. We didn't really put a moratorium on it or any of that sort of stuff. We just hit the pause button. If you can't pay, it's fine. Pay us back later. Um, and you know, we, we got that. And, and the reason for that is because we got that $1,200. You know, a lot of people today got that $1,200 into their, uh, into their accounts. Um, I did not. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't make, I don't make, uh, that much money um so i'm sure that they don't count me as a real person 
uh, which means that they don't have to give me or anybody else that is, that is in my position um, where they don't make a specific amount of money. Uh, so they are not considered a, uh, you know, they're just not considered, uh, you know, someone that should be able to receive this sort of a stimulus. And so we get this one time check and that's supposed to cover everything. You know, so, oh, you did, weren't able to pay your rent in April. That's okay. You got this one check. This one check should cover you for, what, like a year? Something like that. What are people making these days? The government, they, they're so out of touch that they're like 1200 bucks. Perfect. Perfect. That'll get them through maybe 18, that'll get them through the 18 months, Right. Because I've never set foot into a real grocery store um, in about seven years. And, uh, and I figure, you know, it, things are looking good for me. Things have to be looking good out there. So, you know, what's food cost? 38 cents? I don't know. I'm not really sure. No, they have no idea. So they're like twelve hundred bucks. That should kick. That that kills it. We're killing it. We're killing it. They can pay their rent and their bills. They, we don't need to freeze anything. You know, we've we've got the economy on lock, baby. And it's very short sighted, <laughs> to say the least. It's super short sighted. Um, because here's the thing: uh, when this quarantine situation comes to a close whatever it does a lot of people are saying june there are some people that are saying july other people are saying 18 months there are some people that are saying by the end of this month um you know uh, it'll still take average people another month or two before they can get back to just even right i'm not talking about where they're where they're back to having a surplus of things i'm you know, where, where they feel like they can go out and, uh, and have a, a drink at a bar or, or spend a little extra money on a, uh, you know, on a, on a show or a movie or something along those lines. Um, I'm talking about just getting back to even where they can pay their bills, where they can pay for food, put gas in their car, uh, you know, take care of their utility bills, things of that sort. That's a month to two months just to work their way back up to that. Now, you add this fake stimulus check that isn't going to make a dent in fucking anything, right? It's, it's, it's basically like, uh, like, like throwing a feather in an airplane in order to try to break the hull. You're throwing a feather and it's like, oh, no. That's that's essentially what that twelve hundred dollars. It's just gone. It's gone. Oh no, it's gone. It's disappeared. It's not going to do anything, because when all this is over, there's still debt to be paid back on top of the debt that we were already paying back, right? And if it's going to take a month or two just without all the additional debt burdens that are going to come out of this this quarantine situation. Uh, that's a month or month or two to, to do that my, is, is my estimate. There's going to be some people that are probably going to have, it might take them longer. Um, but if you add all these back payments to it, it's going to take a whole lot longer. And who's going to suffer is small businesses, individuals, sole proprietorships, you know, the mom and pop shops who are already suffering to begin with because they also, I mean, you could literally... Uh, replace the word tenant with small business owners and it's the same situation it's the same situation I mean that's kind of what's happening with my car payments right now my car payments uh, you know I called them and I basically said hey I'm, I'm in this situation where you know I've lost v virtually all of my income um, and they said well we can put a moratorium on your payments I said okay that's fine what does that mean and they said well your your payments you don't have to make a payment for three months there's going to be no interest charge nothing 
Um, and I was like, okay, so what does that mean? What's the catch here? And they're like, well, it just means that, um, you know, you have to pay it off in the same amount of time. We, there, there's no like extended three months. Like they didn't shift my timeline. And I was like, is that it? That's like the only option that I have. It's either I have to make the payments, which I can't afford to do, um, or I, I have to essentially figure out these three month back payments. They're like, yeah, but you don't have to worry about that until the, until the very end of your payment anyway. And I was like, okay. I mean, that kind of seems like I don't really have an option here. So I have to take that. And they're like, yeah, but you don't have to worry about it till the end. You know, so. And again, I consider myself lucky in that term. I wonder how many people don't have that kind of luxury. Um, where, where perhaps they have a car payment that, that doesn't do that. Perhaps they have a car payment that defers their payment for three months, but at the once that those payments restart, their minimum payment is now gone up in order to account for the three months of deference. That's another option that they, I mean, these are all really bad ideas. These are not how you stimulate the economy, but they're not trying to stimulate our economy. This is, once again, we go back to the proof of there's two different kinds of economies. There's the economy for the rich and the economy for the rest of us, the working class people. Um, they don't give a shit about us. I mean, they're gonna funnel more money, you know, up at the top anyway. And this is, and, and, and look, things were difficult as it is, right? Like things were already kind of pretty difficult. Like pre-COVID, 78% of people were living paycheck to paycheck. 58 couldn't were, uh, afford a uh, $500 emergency. I mean, I'm, I'm part of that statistic for sure. You know, I, I basically, when I would, you know, full, as a full-time touring performer, whatever I make was going into paying those bills, paying my rent, paying my um, whatever utilities I had, paying off my car, paying gas, groceries, things of that sort. And, you know, whatever little I had left was uh, was awesome. It was great. I was like, oh, my God, I, may, I might be able to go see my friend's performance this month at the, at the brewery or whatever. You know, I might be able to have a beer at, a, at an open mic or something. Um, you know, now, now that we are in this post-COVID world, 20% um, of people have lost a uh, significant portion of their income, if not all. And unemployment is heading to 30%, which is Great Depression numbers. Um, you know, so this is, this is the situation that we're in. This is the situation America is in. Other countries are handling, um, you know, handling this situation a lot differently. They are putting in uh, additional social programs into place to protect their uh, working class people. You know, like in Europe, a lot of countries are offering 70 to 80 to 90 percent of your income. Um, you know, so you there are some countries even looking at a permanent UBI situation. Um, Venezuela, for example, too. Venezuela, which uh, a lot of people are like, oh, fucking communist bullshit. Well, here, they're doing a rent freeze for six months. They have a program to make sure that uh, 7 million families get groceries. During this pandemic, um, they are implementing additional social protections and making sure that their citizens are taken care of over, you know, uh, corporate profits. And not only is it during this pandemic, uh, but it's also when they're receiving sanctions from the United States. Illegal sanctions from the United States are being put upon Venezuela, and Nicolas Maduro has still taken care of his people, and he's still blacklisted and badmouthed by a country that has done fucking nothing by the way, nothing to take care of its people. They chastise countries that do. You know, they make fun of them. They, they literally, which is what they did for Venezuela, they put a hit for $15 million out on Nicolas Maduro. <laughs> and this guy just put a six month rent freeze. We're not even thinking about that right now. Some people are not 
Uh, some people are not thinking about that. A majority of the American leadership is not thinking about that. There are some people that are, though. Um, the Lan There's a Lansing Tenant Union being formed. Uh, Brandon Betts, who has been a guest on uh, my podcast, Taboo Table Talk, I uh, highly recommend you listen to that episode. Um, the I think the plan, right, I'm going to try to reach out to Brandon again to get him back on the podcast to kind of talk about you know, how, how Lansing has dealt with this situation. Um, Brandon um, is part of the Lansing Tenant Union because he's a rent payer in Lansing, Michigan. Oh, God, I just spilled coffee <laughs> all over myself. <laughs> Good job, Chris. Great job. Uh, anyway, Brandon Brandon is part of the, the, the Tenants uh, Union, the... Uh, Lansing Tenant Union, um, and, uh, you know, he sees this as a worthwhile, valuable thing to do, um, and the point of the Lansing Tenant Union is to build power through sol solidarity among all of the tenants in Lansing, Michigan. That's, that's the whole, that's the whole point. Again, it's building solidarity, so all, uh, there, there's a bunch of people, a bunch of tenants all across the city of Lansing that are like, hey, we're in a dire situation, and we really need the city and the landlord's in the city to be um, understanding and sympathetic to our situation. Um, and this is a quote, the uh, more power to fight for their rights when they stand together. And that's what we have to do. We, ha we all have to stand together. So if you see any sort of uh, building or tenants that are saying, hey, we're trying to implement a rent strike, uh, you know, stand with them because we're all kind of going through this shit together. This is not the time for you to come out and and scream hand out. So you're looking for no, we're 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 scared, and we're kind of going through some tough shit. And don't pretend like you're not by screaming scared, uh, hand out socialism, whatever the fuck. Uh, who gives a shit? Are you gonna help out your fellow man? That's the bigger question here. And stand with them. The fight really is for. Um, the, the rent freeze, not, not just, a, a, you know, a, the, the suspension um, and, and uh, the moratoriums that we uh, that we've that, you know, that, that have been pitifully granted to us because they're giving us a twelve hundred dollar check, one twelve hundred dollar check, which for most people is virtually their bills for the entire month. Um, so you basically covered one month without, but then there's groceries, there's, you know, like, uh, there's a bunch of other things that pop up, you know. So, um, that's really what this is for. Um, but the reason why they want this moratorium over the freezes where, you know, nobody pays rent and there's no worry about back pay, there's no worry about interest or accumulations or any of that sort of stuff. It's just, okay, you know what? We're just not going to do rent uh, for small businesses and tenants this month. That's it. Uh, don't worry about it. There's a couple people that are doing that. There's a few landlords that are taking it upon themselves um, to do that. And, you know, more landlords should be encouraged to do that sort of stuff. And again, it, when, when they kind of do, when they kind of go up against that, then we can also have a mortgage strike along with the same thing. But the reason why they want that, that back pay and, you know, the liens and all, because America's run on a debt economy. We're run on the fact that we're all in debt to big banks. We're all in debt to the financial sector. You know, they've given out these loans and now we have to pay them back in order to keep the banks rolling and you know somehow somebody moves money from here to here and in that move there's more money made and there's an interest level here and somehow some the banks are making more money than anybody can ever imagine right that's how the rules of this sort of shit works and it's very stupid and doesn't make any fucking sense it makes sense if you look at uh, look at it and you know as possibly cheating the american people <laughs> but that's what it is it's a debt economy we need to be in debt in order to keep the economy moving. And what this situation is proving now is that that system, when you run an economy on debt, when you run an economy whose debt is, debt is also funding wars that causes the death of other people, that economy has failed. 
it has failed. So, Brandon's not the only one doing this, by the way. We also have Shama Savant in Seattle. Uh, both of them are Socialist City Council members. Um, you know, she's fighting for a rent freeze in Seattle right now. Um, and not just Seattle, but for the entire state of Washington. Um, and this is one of the things that she points out is this debt economy. Um, the reason why debt is so important to these people is because it provides an opportunity for parasitic capitalistic companies to create a system of oppression and slavery. <sighs> That's a lot. <laughs> But it does, it, it, you know, they, they kind of look at these disasters um, and they put more financial stresses and more financial uh, pressures on average working class citizens uh, and poor people like me and probably a lot of you watching out there. And, um, and you know, eventually we have to, we, we, we end up going into these debt crises and, uh, uh, you know, and, and it gives them an opportunity to be like, oh, do you want to come out of debt? Then here's some things that we're going to put into place that are going to definitely benefit us that'll help you get out of debt. You know, they did that with, with um, you know, the destruction of the public schools in New Orleans by putting in charter schools and um, really displacing communities of color by doing that. Um, and and they'll they'll frame it as oh well we're helping we're helping the community and you know we're 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 bringing people together when in reality that it doesn't um, what it does is it creates a, a, a you know it's just more opportunities for them to come in and control different neighborhoods control different aspects of your community uh, so that people don't have the the resources and, and um, know how to fight back against that. Now, Shama Savant in Seattle did win. She banned evictions um, during the colder months. She basically said no evictions during the colder months, and she won, right? Um, and, um, and she's saying that, you know, these rent freezes, it, it's basically the same kind of principle, is that the situation and the conditions that we are in right now are, you know, uh, we're, looking at, we're, we're looking at a possible humanitarian crisis. Uh, where, you know, if people can't pay back these, these you know, re back rents and stuff like that, what's going to happen? It, you're probably going to look at a, a, a mass amount of evictions. You're going to look at eviction cases. You're going to look at uh, sheriffs coming out and taking people out of their homes and all of that sort of stuff. So, and this is not just her saying that. And this is, the economic projections are bad because the system is too top heavy. That's really it. You know, you have people from the Fed that are like, well, we really got to save the banks. We really got to buffer the banks. I mean, sure, the banks are making trillions and trillions of dollars. And then we also made trillions and trillions of dollars up out of thin air and then funneled it into the banking system, which they spent through because they're like a 12 year old with a, you know, a trust fund account. And they don't really know what money management actually looks like. And now they're blaming the American people for it. But we need to bail them out. We need to put more money into it uh, more aggressively. That's what the Fed is saying. The, basically, the economy is run by people who play Jenga, uh, but the first thing they do is remove the, the strip from the very bottom part. And then when it all topples, they're like, how'd that happen? It's so crazy. I was trying to protect a penthouse situation, and all of a sudden, it's all gone. How did that even happen? Maybe we should build the top part. Maybe we should just build the top part up again. Do you think that's... Can we just build the top part up again and pretend I... Pretend that that part didn't happen where I just d completely removed the bottom foundation, the, the base and the foundation that things should be built from, you know, like how logic dictates things are built. Maybe, maybe we can just pretend that it doesn't exist and it's just, can we float? Is there a floating mechanism for the Jenga? That's how they look at the economy. Now, um, Governor Jay Inslee, who some people might remember as presidential candidate Jay Inslee, um, who there was a bunch of people that liked him. He had some things to say about um, environmentalism that were pretty solid. He was kind of became like the climate change um, candidate. And Jay Inslee has not responded to Shama Savant at all. Uh, same thing with, uh, you know, Michigan as well. 
Uh, let's talk, Governor Cuomo is, you know, the New York governor. We talked about him yesterday. Uh, governor Cuomo has put moratoriums on evictions and rent, but, you know, that's because he kind of had to. It's a gov- gubernatorial l- loophole that when your state goes into a state of emergency, you have to put those measures in place. That's sort of a requirement. Um, but he's not really worried about putting freezes in place. He's not really worried about people uh, not being able to afford to pay rent or you know, pay pay back rent or any of that sort of stuff when we come out of this this situation. What he's cur- worried about is uh, making sure rich people in New York are taken care of so that they, can, they will come back to the state of New York um, and, you know, vacation in the Finger Lakes for three weeks. And that's who he caters to. He caters to those tourists because they have money and they'll donate to his campaign and help him win again so he can fuck over hospital workers and poor people. Yay, Cuomo. But that's what the system is doing, too. The system is banking on the fact that we're all going to be scared. Um, And they'll try to exploit that fear. They'll be that parasite uh, that will exploit that fear um, and pit us against each other. That, oh, somebody's not going to pay their rent. Well, they're just lazy. Look, we gave them we gave them money. What do they want? What do they want? How much more do they want? We have to save money for the banks who, I mean, there's a guy that we hire to wax the bull and then we hire a separate person to wax just the testicles of the bull because that's really important. The shine from the testicles is really what shows you the strength of Wall Street. And, uh, and you know, that's uh, just to get the, the products, the maintenance, that's a trillion and a half dollars alone just for the bull and then we have all those bankers that destroyed america in 2008 that we have to take care of and not put in prison you know and that takes a lot of money so you know maybe maybe renters should think about that fucking sad and pathetic (laughs) is what they are all right let's head to our uh, second story of the day. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the Battle of Blair Mountain, the ongoing battle of Blair Mountain, as it were. Um, so the important thing to learn, to, to kind of note before we go into the real battle of Blair Mountain, as there's always a little something uh, to these, right? Like, it's just not just like, oh, the strike just happened. Because, oh, people were just like, we don't like it here. And, like, there's real legitimate reasons for why these strikes happen. So sometimes you got to go back uh, a little further beyond just the, that one moment in, in history. Um, so, you know, in the early 1900s, late, late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, coal companies were, were coming into power. And really by the early 1900s, uh, coal companies, especially in, um, well, particularly, I'll say particularly in Southern West Virginia, basically, uh, owned towns. They they purchased the land that towns were in, um, and uh, they kind of created corporate prison labor camps. Which I know it sounds like I'm kind of talking about a dystopian future, but I am talking about a dystopian past that has just evolved into something different now. Uh, these towns were the the miners first of all the miners were not paid hourly they were paid by tonnage um they were paid by how many tons of um coal they could they could mine out uh of the tunnels and the mountains themselves and then when they were paid they weren't actually paid in real money they were paid in uh scripts it's basically like it's not real money it's like corporate money that they can only use within the corporate town. So they would use these scripts to uh, buy coal from the coal company, coal that they mined. They had to pay, use these scripts to buy coal, right? And the cost of that was determined by the coal company. They were uh, charged rent that would come out of their pay every single month. Uh, And that was going back to the coal company. And then they would only be able to buy um, rations uh, and food from the store in the town that was owned by the coal company. 
Now, the coal company would sell this for like actual currency, right? Not just something that they made, not the Disney money that they made up that they can only circulate through their own little town, right? And it was a way of ensuring control. It was a way of ensuring the, um, this, this bought loyalty, essentially, right? And, and if you attempted to, if you attempted to um, go out and, uh, and, and procure real money, uh, first of all, you would not be able to buy anything from in that town, and, uh, and then you would be severely punished for it. Now, this is how the coal companies were operating. Um, and not only that, they were, they were trying to prevent anybody from the outside from coming in to, you know, kind of unionize the workers to, to try to build any sort of labor movement. Um, so they hired sheriffs and uh, hired guns, which, which we've seen before. We, we, every time there's been a strike, every time there's been some sort of worker movement that comes up, um, you know, these corporations and these uber, uh, uber rich people uh, will, will hire a sheriff and will deputize a bunch of, you know, arbitrary people, just average regular people, average working class people, um, and have them point guns at other average working class people. This is how they operate, right? Saw this with uh, Oli Hansen in 1919 in Seattle. Saw this with Andrew Carnegie and Henry Frick with the Pinkertons. You saw this, you know, at Haymarket, even again with the Pinkertons. Saw this in uh, Winnipeg. You saw this in New Zealand with the Specials, right, which were just average regular people uh, that, they, that they hired and deputized and gave them guns. Common thing, common thing. Really goes to show how obsessed that um, certain people are with the idea of, you know, being being that kind of military hero, but not really serving in that sort of military hero kind of thing. Like, and this was like before, you know, we glorified things with like Rambo and you know, fucking Predator and all this. You know, where like the military dudes are like the big jacked up heroes and. Uh, you know, it's like the one lone gunman saves the day kind of thing. Like, that's just a deep-rooted thing that's in human society um, to, to be deputized and, and be this kind of badass. So, all that is going on. And this is where things start kicking off. At, the, at something called the Meituan Massacre. Um deputized miners and a guy by the name of Albert Feltz, who is one of the owners of this coal company in southern West Virginia, uh, illegally affected a miner's family. Really had no reason to do it. Uh, the husband wasn't home, so, you know, they, they, they brought these deputized miners. They held the family at gunpoint, and they started taking them out. And as they got to the train station... Um, the, uh, the sheriff stopped them, uh, police, or I'm sorry, the police chief of the town stopped them. Police chief Hatfield, Sid Hatfield. Um, and he was basically, what the fuck is going on here? And the, and you know, Albert Feltz was like, Hey, I, I got a warrant. Okay. I got a warrant. You don't have any jurisdiction here. Uh, get that, get out of my way. I'm taking, these people are donezo, blah, blah, blah. So eventually the police chief pushed back on Albert Feltz. And, uh, and, and the mayor got involved, and the mayor showed up, and Albert Felt was like, hey, I got a warrant, and he shows the warrant, and the mayor goes, well, that's a fake warrant. This warrant is bogus, uh, is what the legend says. Uh, and at that point, you know, it became a big gunfight. Um, the, uh, the, the, the Felts, the, the deputies of the Felts were uh, pushed back, and they lost. Uh, and this was like a big union battle, and, and now Sid Hatfield had become this sort of union hero for the miners, right? Because this town had just been opened up. The, the company had uh, lost control of this town. And, um, you know, because of that, because there was this big pushback, uh, a lot of other skirmishes started happening in southern West Virginia. And this is particular to southern West Virginia because the northern states had a pretty strong... Uh, union presence where where the coal companies couldn't go into Pennsylvania and set up a uh, you know essentially a corporate prison labor camp um, at, you know with with their weirdo fucking rules and their and their authoritarian control um, 
so now there was a bunch of skirmishes and battles along southern West Virginia where the unions were starting to take control, particularly, um, what's the union called? Oh, I wrote it down. Sorry about this. The, the United Mine Workers. The United Mine Workers. Um, so they were starting to take control of some of these big, you know, these mining towns. And there was, a, there was pushback from the non-union mining companies and the unions themselves. Uh, eventually, you know, a Hatfield gets called up a, in a trial um, and a bunch of other people get called up on trials of like murder and conspiracy and stuff like that. And uh, the, th there's a lot of escalation that keeps happening between between Hatfield and the Felts um, and the non-union mining companies and eventually Hatfield is killed he gets shot uh, and at that point it was like okay this thing is gonna fucking get real bad right so they so the United Mine Workers who were the unions that were that was really gaining control in in southern West Virginia um, said let's we're, we're gonna call for a rally in um, in Charleston, West Virginia. We're gonna call for like a march in Charleston, West Virginia. And of course, the non-union mining companies were not going to let their miners go join this rally uh, because that's not gonna serve their purpose. They're gonna lose profits. They're gonna to have to sell coal at a higher price. They're gonna to have to pay their fucking employees real money, you know, not have a prison labor camp um, under the name of freedom, which is the most hypocritical, ironic thing I've ever heard. Uh, so, particularly the mi miners from Logan and Mingo County were blocked at Bel Blair Mountain. Uh, they were, they were um, led by Bill Blizzard, uh, and uh, they were blocked by Sheriff Chafin and his, his deputies, his hired guns, essentially. The mercenaries that... Uh, and, and, and Sheriff Chafin was being paid um, by the coal company in Logan County and Mingo County, which is particularly why they were uh, blocking these miners. And Sh and Chafin wanted a battle. Like, he wanted to fucking take down these, uh, you know, these fucking union people. So, he really wanted the battle. Now, President Harding at the time, who was this president that was like, oh, we want to go back to normalcy, after everything that happened with the war, we saw all these strikes in 1919, and, you know, that's not what I'm about. I'm about getting you back to normal. I'm about, you know, not having these, 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 these uh, obstacles in the way. Um, I'm a good guy. I'm a good guy. I care about you, the working class person, and I don't want these strikes. I don't want these conflicts. I don't want these obstacles to get in your way. Um, so, so he kind of ran on that, that let's go back to normal, you know, let's, let's make America great again. <laughs> uh, he's not even, he's not even that original to come up with, uh, his own fucking thing. So President Harding, um, basically tells these miners, look, you're going to, you're, I'm going to have to send federal troops, um, you know, and uh, in the meantime, he had already called the National Guard, which was led by like a World War I uh, war hero, and he brought in bombers. And the bombers, the wording was, uh, Harding was like, hey, that's a bad idea. Don't, don't use these bombers. Um, so he used them for surveillance instead of actually uh, murdering American citizens. But, um, you know, so there was like a National Guard, Army National Guard uh, encampment in, at Blair Mountain, plus the police, uh, plus Chafin and his, uh, his mercenary troop. And this guy really wanted a battle. So the coal company who was paying them paid for, um, you know, essentially battle planes to go drop bombs um, on, uh, on the striking miners, right? So, so that's what Chafin did. Chafin used these planes and he dropped bombs. The coal company paid to drop bombs on these miners uh, which no matter how you look at that sentence in whatever uh, whatever iteration of the word minor you look at it's it's a bad it's a bad thing 
uh, either the coal companies uh, paid to essentially try to murder their own employees uh, or murder children, which I don't think is above what a coal company would pay to do. Like, if there was, like, a bunch of seven-year-olds that were like, we don't want daddy to be in the mining thing, and they formed a union, like a seven-year-old union, I think that they would bomb seven-year-olds. Because that's how much ethics and morality the coal companies actually have. Any corporation really does. So after this happens, uh, you know, there's a bunch of battles. Like, they, you know, a lot of retaliatory efforts. Uh, federal troops from Kentucky arrive. And at that point, Bill Blizzard is just like, this is, this, we're, this is going to end in a fucking massacre of my people. Um, and he doesn't want to see any more working class people die. So he said, let's bury our guns and we'll, and we'll go, we'll go quietly. And, you know, so, so that's what happened. So what's the takeaway in this situation is, um, this is President Harding for as much as let's go back to normal as he preached at the end of the day um, supported the corporation that wanted to put a labor camp in southern West Virginia. The United States government supported a, uh, a, a, a plan, a philosophy to put a labor camp rather than support the working class people. And that's the sort of pushback we'll probably see from the federal government. And that's the pushback we can be prepared for going into future strikes, going into future uh, ideals of the labor movement. If we're going to push for, for, for working class rights, if we're going to push for a better tomorrow, these are the lessons we need to learn. They're going to strike with violence. And they're the ones that strike with violence, right? The, the, the coal companies hired, uh, you know, Chaffee and his, his mercenaries and then bombed American citizens. Um, President Harding sent the military in defense of corporations And that's what they're going to do. The Battle for Blair Mountain didn't end in 1921. Uh, kind of an ongoing battle because you have you have um, uh, like Massey Energy, which is a you know basically a a company that is for mountaintop removal, and they've been fighting for years to blow up Blair Mountain. And and the way mountaintop removal works is they, you know completely get rid of the forests they bulldoze the bottom part of the mountain and then they dynamite the top part of it so they can go in from the top to get all the coal it poisons the land it it destroys natural resources um it destroys you know a, a, a monument of nature itself there's a reason why that mountain is there the way that it's there they move rivers it's the ego. They don't give a shit about the, the fucking environment, right? So this has been going back and forth, though. This has been going back and forth, right? They've been, they've been trying to deem Blair Mountain not a historical site, and then they do deem it a historical site, and then they don't deem it a historical site, and then they push back legally, and they do deem it back to a historical site. Um, and uh, 2018 seemed to be the last thing where they did restore it back to being a historical site, so they haven't fully won yet. Um, but part of the reason why they want to blow it up is because they want to hide their own history. They want to hide the history of the labor movement itself. Because if they blow it up, then the buried guns disappear. The, the, the rifles disappear. Where do they drop? The bombs disappear. And it just becomes a story in history. They want to take that away. That's their plan. I've been thinking about this for uh, probably a year, year and a half, that, you know, there's a lot of stereotypes about the South and West Virginia where, uh, you know, they're, they're dumb, they're fucking hicks. 
they're, you know, they're fucking their cousins or whatever the fuck. The lunatic fucking stereotypes of the South are that every hack comedian will make. Uh, And I tour the South and the Midwest, the places where these people are called hicks and rednecks and dumbasses and all this shit. And I'm looking at it going, well, this is the height of the labor movement. That's, I mean, you know, West Virginia was a hotbed for, for union activity, for, 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 for the rights of workers. What makes them dumb hicks? Because they talk a little different? Or is it because you have corporations like Massey that want you to forget that history? That, that want you to, that, that come into these towns, own them, corrupt and destroy the education system, take that opportunity through a, either a natural disaster or, or creating that themselves, creating a system themselves that no working class coal miner can send their kid to a school that they can't afford and they go, look at this uneducated piece of shit. And they created that system. And then they told the rest of the country, look at these dumb, uneducated hicks. What do you mean? They figured out how to fight you back. They figured out how to push coal companies that created labor camps back. You know who the dumb hicks are? You know who the, 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 the fucking, uh, you, you know, uh, the, the, the idiots are in this situation? Coal companies. They're the ones that embody the hubris that is laughed at by, pe- by, by people that think that the South is a bunch of dumb redneck hicks. What is dumber than putting a labor camp in a country that's supposed to stand for the freedom of the working people? That's fucking dumb. So it's not these workers, it's not the citizens of West Virginia, it's not the citizens of the South. It is any corporation that goes in to exploit them. The reason why you think that is because you've been exploited. All right, I think we're going we're gonna to end it there <laughs> on that note. Uh, don't get exploited, uh, I think, is the lesson that we all can take from there. Uh, but uh, thank you for tuning in, thank you for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know we this is two two big topics that we kind of took a longer, deeper dive into. Um, so uh, yeah, I think uh, you know, thank you guys for for hanging in there and and uh, digging into it with us. Um, tomorrow is the day off. I'm going to be working on uh, getting taboo table talk up. Uh, got a, a, a um, uh, what's the topic of discussion? There is going to be the way the United States is. Um, continuing its economic wars and its uh, not so economic wars um, all around the world, uh, you know, in the presence of COVID, in the presence of this virus, during a pandemic when everybody's calling the ceasefire. So we're going to talk about a lot of the details surrounding that. Um, and then we're, we're going to do Philosophy Friday, Storytelling Saturday. We go live on Sunday. So, uh, you know, I hope you guys have a productive rest of the week. I hope you guys have a fantastic evening. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that's it. And go check out that new stand-up clip. Uh, you know, sign up for the email list if you haven't done so. Um, and what else am I missing? If you can donate, feel free to donate. Uh, that's always a thing that you can do to, uh, to help me out, you know, um, in, in the current situation that we're in. Uh, if you, if you have the ability to donate, please do. If you, um, if you don't, that's okay. All my shit's going to be available for free anyway. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for details about a Zoom show. Keep your eyes peeled for, uh, the release of my new stand-up comedy album. All those will be coming in the next week, and I'm sure I will talk about them ad nauseum, uh, on these videos as well. Um, and keep an eye out for forkfuls. I'm very desperately trying to get those out. <laughs> Putting as much effort uh, into a 24-hour period as I possibly can. Uh, but thank you guys. I really appreciate the support. I really appreciate you guys watching this stuff. Uh, but till, uh, till Friday, see you on the road.